Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message. But at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. Good morning everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rob Williams and I'm the lead pastor here at The Bridge and we just want to welcome you to The Bridge Live Online. If you're joining us for the first time, you need to know that we are so glad you're with us. Here at The Bridge, we make it a point to do all we can to uh, short of sin to connect people to God. That's our mission, to become bridges between God and people. And here at The Bridge, we want you to know that it is a, that this is a safe place to wrestle and learn and even disagree. There aren't too many places that are safe to do that right now, um, but we take pride in being exactly that here. So welcome. I pray that this time is beneficial for you and your family, and, and I pray that you're staying safe during this difficult season. Before we get started this morning, I want to remind you uh, of all of our plans as a church as Christmas approaches. Over the last couple of weeks, the leadership team and I have come to uh, the most difficult decision to keep our in-person services closed until Christmas Eve. The entire state of Iowa has become a hot zone for the coronavirus. The numbers in Floyd County have only gotten worse since we closed our doors a couple of weeks ago, and our schools, hospitals, and businesses are overwhelmed and struggling to stay open on a number of different fronts. Just this last week, our church sent volunteers to our local schools just to help them serve meals uh, as many of their staff had become infected or at least exposed to the virus in some way. I'm proud to know that we're available and, and willing to do stuff like that, that our church is stepping on the front lines to be ministers of the gospel. But it also broke my heart to see the morale of all the school staff as I helped personally volunteer there myself. If you think of it, maybe write a letter or send a gift to some of our school staff this week. They're all working so hard and doing everything they can to fight for our kids and love them and educate them. It's been such a difficult season for teachers and school staff and they need our blessing, church. People are tired, people are burned out, people are hurting and struggling as they pour themselves out uh, for the education, health, and safety of others. It's a hard season and, and we here at The Bridge wanna do all we can to serve, love, and give to our community during this time. Like I said a few weeks ago, we want to give ourselves up for the benefit of others, even if that means giving up something that is so precious to us, like gathering in person for a while. I firmly and passionately believe that's what Jesus would do. Now, here's the good news. Right now, our staff and leadership are planning to put together an awesome Christmas Eve service that we are hoping and praying we can have in person. Okay, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. Our prayer is that the numbers will decrease as we get to get a handle on this thing into the winter months. Our goal is to have Christmas Eve in person though. Don't worry, for those of you that aren't comfortable coming to services in person, we still plan to put together an awesome online experience as well. But our prayer is that we might be able to have Christmas Eve services this year and that we will never want to forget rather than ones that we wish to forget like the rest of 2020. So right now, as I plan to do for the next few weeks, I'd like us to just stop and pray for those dealing with COVID, for our schools and our leaders and so many other variables that have come during this difficult time in our lives. Can we just do that for a minute? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And we thank you for um, just the blessing that we have to continue to connect online. Lord, I can't imagine living in an age where um, we would be dealing with such a disease like this and we wouldn't be able to gather in some way as a church body, God. The fact that we have technology is a huge blessing. And Lord, I just thank you for the fact that you can redeem technology and make it something that's so awesome. It's something that can be used for your glory in so many ways, Lord. But right now, God, we want to stop and um, just lift up those dealing with the 
coronavirus, Lord. Uh, we have a number of people in our congregation. We have a number of people in our community. We have a number of people in our schools that are fighting this thing to the death um, in so many different ways, Lord. And, and God, I just want to thank you for their hard work, for all that they're doing to try and, and um, beat this thing. Um, Lord, thank you for all of our public servants. Thank you for everyone that's working so hard to keep us safe, Lord. God, I, I pray for wisdom and safety over our church and our community. I pray for blessing as we try to um, take care of one another and love and support one another, Father. And I pray for your glory to be known through it all, God. Help us to find peace in you, to find comfort in you, and to hold fast to you um, as Christmas rapidly approaches, Lord. Uh, God, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you all in the name of your Son, Jesus. All right, let's dive in. As many of you know, we've been in this series on Philippians for about eight weeks now called No Matter What. And I hope that you haven't gotten tired of it. Uh, uh, I know it's been such a great experience for me personally to dive so deep into this book for the last couple of months. Let's just do a quick, quick refresh for those of you that haven't been with us, though. The book of Philippians is actually a letter written by a man named Paul. And this letter is known as the epistle or the letter of joy, okay? And as we begin to dive into this, began to dive into this series a couple of months ago, I couldn't help but think about how perfect this letter has been for the time that we're in today. Because Paul was writing this letter under difficult circumstances himself, and yet he's found encouraging the church in Philippi to be what? to be joyful. As a matter of fact, almost 20 different times throughout this letter, he talks about rejoicing and joy and, and the spirit-filled attitude that completely transcends his situation, which is exactly the kind of joy that I think we all need in our own lives today. You know, this may seem a little too obvious to mention, but we're all searching for joy on a regular basis. Did you know that? Actually, we all spend much of our lives seeking out joy, probably more than we even realize. I mean, just sit back and think about it. When, we're, when we were kids, okay, we were always looking for things that made us happy. I think, uh, this, I, I think I see this in my kids constantly. Whenever my family has a choice to laugh at something, my kids do all they can to replicate that laughter. They beat a dead horse with a joke, or we'll be wrestling and they'll be laughing and don't ever seem to want to quit wrestling because of the joy and laughter uh, that comes with wrestling with their dad. Um, they, they don't want to want to stop because they don't want the joy to stop. All, all they know is that this is bringing them laughter and fun and joy. And, and it's as though they want that to last forever. And, and I know you remember feeling that same way as a kid as well. But then as kids progress into their teen years, they become really passionate about joy because all they want to do is what? All they want to do is what they want want to do, right? Because those things bring them joy. And they pursue what they do want to do to the point of selfishness. Don't get me wrong, kids do this too, but it seems like it can be magnified sometimes when kids become teens, can't it? For those of you that have teenagers as parents, I'm sure you completely agree with this in some way, shape, or form. Then we become adults and we go to college to find a career that will bring us the most joy. And we marry the best spouse that will bring us the most joy. And we work hard to buy the best house that will bring us the most joy. That we might have kids and sometimes live, sometimes we live vicariously through our kids to find what? To find joy. And eventually we want to retire someday so we can go back to our teen years and just do whatever we want as we eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of our lives in our never ending pursuit of joy. If you think about it, you come to realize that this is the American dream. A life that is solely built on the pursuit of happiness. And yet, if you're a believer, then you should know that none of these things can actually produce joy in and of themselves. I mean, we, we should know that, that anything built on external circumstances doesn't last forever. Paul knows that too. We read about it a couple in the last couple of weeks. He said, everything I have, I count as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. This last week I realized something though. As, as much as our lives here in America have become completely engrossed in this pursuit of happiness, lately I, I feel like we're chasing it even more than before. But let me explain what I mean. Over the last couple of weeks I've noticed a lot of people are just starving for Christmas. Have you noticed that? 
it seems like people that usually don't even want to rush Christmas most years are beginning to rush it this year. Stores are playing Christmas music earlier and earlier. Families are putting up their Christmas trees early. It's like people just want Christmas to get here because Christmas is the season of joy. And not only that, it means that we're much closer to 2020 finally being over. And I think we can all agree that the sooner 2020 is over, the better. How many of you relate to this crowd? I'll be honest with you, there have been a lot of days uh, that I've related to these things. Heck, I, I'm usually religious about waiting until after Thanksgiving to put our tree up, but this year I've contemplated doing it early a few different times. This year has been hard. And the thing that, uh, that I've got so many friends, the thing is that I've got so many friends, we've got all so many family members in the church that have had, had a much harder year than many of us have had even. And we all just seem to want Christmas to get here. As if that's going to take away all of our trials and tribulations and heartache and pain. I know you know this, but, but, but let's just say it out loud. Can, can, can we just say this together? That's not going to work. That's not going to work. And I know that you know that as much as I do, but, but I think it's important that we just say it out loud. It, it's not going to work. Sure, it might push the pain aside for a little while, but, but it'll be back. Let's be honest. Especially if we don't deal with it the right way, it will definitely be back. The good news, in the next section of Paul's letter to Philippi, I think he gives us a little bit of a cure for the sorrow that we're facing. What we're going to talk about today isn't uh, the be-all, end-all kind of cure, but, it definitely, but I definitely think it's something that we don't tend to do naturally, especially after we've spent an entire year getting beat down over and over and over again. So let's just check this out. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible with you at home, or uh, uh, I, as always, I want to encourage you to download an awesome app on your phone or your smart, smart device or tablet uh, called Version. That's Y-O-U version. And it's an awesome and easy way to have scripture available to you at all times. Uh, but once again, we'll, today we'll be in Philippians 4. If you were with us last week, you might remember Paul teaching the church in Philippi the most practical way to pursue holiness or sanctification. To pursue those two things, we have to pursue Christ and draw closer to Him that we might be more like Him. And today you're going to find him continuing this theme a bit as he gives us a practical way to pursue joy despite their circumstances. Listen to what he writes. We're going to pick things up in Philippians chapter 4 right in verse 1. Let's just read this together. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the, uh, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Iodia and I plead with Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay, so let's just pick things up right here real quick, all right? Um, Paul says, stand firm in Christ by doing a couple of things here throughout this section of scripture that we're about to look at. The first thing he commands them to do is deal with the situation between Iodia and Sintichi, okay? Two women of faith that obviously worked together alongside Paul in the gospel. In other words, what Paul's saying here is deal with the fights and quarrels among you. Where is there anger or distrust or bitterness in your life? Where are people fighting or not getting along? Where are we not of one mind in our relationships? Deal with that, he says. This is something we can all relate to. When relationships aren't right between us or other people or even just between two dear friends that we know, it destroys the morale of the whole group, right? This is why it's awkward when we see married couples fight in public. This is why we hate getting, getting in the middle of our friends' disagreements. This is why we can't stand it as, kid, uh, as kids when our parents fight, no matter how old we are. It's, it's hard to watch. It's, it's hard to be around. And it completely destroys the leadership and the morale of the team or the family. And in some cases, it forces us to pick sides and divides more people in the long run. I'll be honest with you, as I was studying this passage this week, my original intent, intent was to just lightly touch on this part of the passage and move on to verses 4 through 9, okay? But then I realized that that would be a huge mistake because conflict, conflict is a ridiculously large issue in our American culture today. 
not just the fact that we have we're, that we're having so much of it. I, I I know we're having a lot of it, but the fact that we can't seem to even understand how to have healthy conflict anymore. Either we completely ag- uh, avoid conflict altogether, allowing anger, bitterness, and pain to boil up in our hearts, or, or we address it in such an ugly and foolish manner where we refuse to listen that we might truly understand one another. It's been horrible, especially during the last political season that didn't just tear our country apart, but seems to have torn our families and homes apart, as well as in certain cases, um, it's torn our, our homes apart. Paul calls the church to resolve their disagreements before he gets to the main point of this section of his letter. It's like he's saying, if you can't settle your disagreements, then there's no way you're going to be able to do what I'm about to tell you. Let's be honest for a moment. I think some of us in the church today need to ask ourselves the following questions. How many of us have some serious disagreements in our families right now? Some serious heartache. How many of us have some serious pain that's risen up through this 2020 season. When I was in college, I took a class on the topic of crisis counseling, and I remember the professor telling us that when crises arrive, they can do one of two things in our lives, okay? They can either magnify how good of a person we are, or they can magnify how terrible of a person we can be. How many of us have the humility to admit that the various crises throughout 2020 have magnified our pride? or our anger, or, or our personal problems that we've been stuffing down for a while? How many of us have the humility to admit that um, 2020 has magnified our marriage problems that we were avoiding? Or the baggage that we've done a pretty good job at ignoring until we were forced to face it in quarantine? Resolve your differences, he says. Seek forgiveness. Deal with your baggage. Have the humility to say that you might have been wrong. Even if you were right or or might be right, you being right is not worth the relationship you could potentially lose by becoming prideful or selfish about that. Paul goes on. Let's just continue to read here. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How can we have joy now? Well, throughout the last few weeks, we know that our true joy comes through, number one, pursuing Jesus. But here we see Paul call the church to resolve their differences. And then as our hearts are free from that bitterness and frustration and become filled with love and grace for others, we can then worship. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let's just dive into some Greek words for a second here, okay? That's the language that this, that this letter was originally written in. And the Greek word for gentleness here is epiakis, okay? And it refers to a spirit that is reasonable, fair-minded, and charitable. It describes someone that's willing to yield his or her own rights to show consideration for others. Does that sound familiar? That's what we've been talking about through the, throughout this whole series, giving yourself up. And then Paul goes on, he says, do nothing Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Greek translation of those words, prayer and petition, are really important in this passage. The Greek word for petition is about casting your cares on God, like we see in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5 about casting your cares on God. But the word prayer there can also be pre- translated as worship and adoration. Did you know that? In other words, this passage could be translated in a different way. In every situation, through worship, adoration, praise, and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And when we put these Greek translations or words together, we find the solution to our desire to have joy now. How do we find joy? We pursue Jesus. 
We, we lovingly resolve our differences and we worship. We yield ourselves to God and others and we worship. That's God's cure for anxiety and stress and heartache and pain and worry. Do not be anxious, he says. Do not worry. Just worship your heavenly Father. Well, Rob, you don't understand how much pain I've been through this year. You don't know how much I've lost. You don't know how much people have hurt me. You don't, you don't get how much my family has divided. I'm not sure I can get out of this hole. I need something fresh. I need a miracle to get out of this hole in 2020, Rob. First off, good news. Jesus is the maker of miracles. He's the maker of miracles, and there is no height, nor depth, nor angel, nor demon, no anxiety or depression, no loss or crisis that can separate you from the love of God. Do you understand that? And number two, Paul understands. He does. Paul understands what you're going through. This man who writes these words that are directing us to run after Jesus, resolve our differences in worship, he's, he's been through way more than, we, than many of us could even imagine. I mean, just, just think about where Paul's coming from. This man that, that says these words, that writes these words, he writes them from prison. He's in prison because he's been unjustly incarcerated. He's been beaten almost to death multiple times to this point. He's, been, he's seen friends and other apostles, other apostles suffer and die for the gospel. He's been abandoned. He's been abused. He's been shipwrecked. He's been hated, hunted, lost his job, his house, his 401k. He has no wife to share the joy of intimacy with, no kids to bring him joy, no hope that any of it will ever change. In fact, he is certain that it's going to only get worse for him. And he and it, he is certain his oppressors, the Jewish religious leaders, are going to kill him. And yet, and yet he worships. And he calls us to do the same. So if I were to give you one application this week, it would be this. Work to worship. Work to worship this week. That's right, sometimes worship is work. Sometimes it's, it's not easy to do. Sometimes it takes a little more inside of us to make this happen. Work to worship. I'll be honest with you, I've had to do this so many times, especially this last year. Heck, just this last week, Stephanie and I had to cancel our Thanksgiving plans with my extended family for fear that we might have been exposed to COVID. It's been hard. And I've had to work hard to worship. But I can tell you this, the times that I've had to work the hardest to worship have been some of the most passionate and spirit-filled experiences I've ever had in my life. In my life. I love how Paul wraps up this section of the letter. He gives us something so practical to do. Listen to what he says. We're going to keep reading right in verse 8. Okay, He says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, he says. Whatever you have learned or received from me or seen in me, put it into practice, Paul says, and the God, the God of peace will be with you. Friends, this is a real practical way to worship. If I were to wrap up these last two verses into one sentence, I would say that Paul is telling us to renew our focus. Not, not ignore all the bad stuff. Don't stuff it down and try and just ignore it. But, but, but maybe, maybe don't focus on it too, so much. Don't focus on it so much. So this is what I want us to do. This is exactly what I want us to do even right now. I, I, I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you're watching this at home or listening to it in your car. Or maybe you're even sitting at your desk in an office somewhere. Wh wherever you are or whatever you're, you're doing, can we just uh, take a moment and stop and worship together? This is going to feel a little bit different and maybe even a little bit awkward, but, but just stop what you're doing. Turn off your phone for a second, unless you're watching it on your phone, obviously. Pull your car over to the side of the road. Maybe stop working for a few minutes and, and just do whatever you have to do to, to stop 
just, just stop and get quiet a moment to worship with me for just a few minutes here. Can, can, can we do this together? Let's do this. Let's take a moment and just close our eyes, our, our, our eyes to solely put our focus on Jesus and his Holy Spirit for a moment. Maybe just, maybe take a deep breath. Feel the air entering your lungs. The book of Job says, The Spirit of God has made me in the, spre- in the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Just that air that you're breathing right now is from your Heavenly Father who loves you. Let's worship our Heavenly Father right now as we look to change our focus. Paul says to think about such things, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, think about these things. Whatever's true, Truth includes facts and statements that are in accordance with reality, not lies or rumors or embellishments. And loyal, faithful, proper, reliable, and genuine truth is a characteristic of God. Whatever is honorable, these matters are worthy of respect, dignified, and exalted in character or excellence. Whatever is right, thoughts and plans that meet God's standards of rightness. They're in keeping with the truth. They are righteous. Whatever's pure, free from contamination or blemish, unmixed and unmodified, wholesome. Paul probably was speaking of moral purity, often very difficult to maintain in thought. Whatever's lovely, thoughts of great moral and spiritual beauty, not evil. Whatever is admirable, things that speak well of the thinker, thoughts that recommend, give confidence in, uh, afford approval or praise, reveal positive and constructive thinking. A believer's thoughts, if heard by others, should be admirable, not embarrassing. Whatever is excellent, moral excellence, nothing of substandard quality. Whatever is worthy of praise. This phrase may be restated as anything that deserves the thinker's praise or anything that God deems praiseworthy. Father, we rejoice in your word this morning. God, we rejoice in the joy that we can have amidst the time and the trials and the the difficulties and the tribulations that we're going through, Lord. God, I pray uh, this week that every single person watching this live stream would be able to stop and worship you. That we might be able to recenter, refocus, and reset on exactly what you would have of us. That you would help us to think about things that are of you, things that are true and right and pure and noble and excellent, Father. God, help us to truly find joy. And rejoice in the Lord always like your, like your, your Apostle Paul declares in his word. Let me say it again, God. We want to rejoice.